But today, I'm excited because we launched this fall's convocation with one of our own, okay? Um, so our speaker today, Dr. John L. Cecil, he's a local of Eastern Kentucky, an alum of U Pike, I guess, was Pike College then? It's probably called Pike College then, okay. Uh, he followed his dream to become a psychologist graduate, graduating summa cum laude with a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Cumberland in 2019. In addition, he has two master's degrees, two postdoctoral certificates, in health and forensic psychology, and is currently working towards a postdoc master's degree in clinical psychopharmacology. Wow, you know you're smart when you have something that long. Um, but in the past, he has used his training to help others when they're fighting against mental health as a therapist. Uh, he has given back to the educational system as a guest lecturer and professor for multiple universities in the tri-state area, and recently has joined in with KaiCom. Uh, in the diagnosis of mental health uh, disorders, so he'll be lecturing our students about that. Currently, Dr. Cecil is using his forensic training as a forensics dedicated or evaluator at multiple state and national. You can see where Dr. Cecil is very dedicated, um, and he is using his gifts, his talents, his passions to really help a lot of people. And in his doctoral research, he was looking at cell phone use, cell phone addiction, and just kind of hearing a very surface uh, idea of his research, I thought that would be a great thing for him to come share, for, uh, share with us, because you can tell maybe in your own life, cell phones have become quite a huge part of your world. So without further ado, man, it's great to see a high college PhD, uh, Dr. John Cecil. Nice to meet you all. Like, I, like he said, I'm Dr. Cecil. I did graduate from here. Um, this is actually where I decided I wanted to become a psychologist. Um, Dr. John Howie, you all know mm -hmm. him. He was the um, defining factor in making me decide that this is what I want to do with my life. Um, I love this school. And if you can't tell by the number of degrees that I have, I really like learning. <laughs> I think I've been in school longer than most people. Um, so I wanted to say thank you for having me here, for one. I thank you all for coming. Um, so today what we're going to do is I want to give you a little bit of an idea about my dissertation. If you aren't familiar with what a dissertation is, basically it's a book that you write whenever you get a PhD. Um, you're giving back to the research community. You're giving back to um, just the field that you choose. Um, mine was about 120 pages. It was not fun to write. Um, but again... If it wasn't for Doc Howie making me, uh, grading me like a grad student, I probably wouldn't have been as successful as I was. So he was hard on me, but he saw potential. And I'm grateful he did. Um, so my dissertation was on social media and mobile technology addiction. Um, we use our phones every day. We, yeah, uh, who's, let's see, you're the oldest gentleman here. So he probably even has a cell phone, correct? Yes. So actually, while we're in here and, and at home watching this, raise your hand if you have a smartphone. Okay. That's everybody. Everybody right now has a smartphone. They did some research, which is one of the things that I looked at, and found that in the United States, 89% of the population have a smartphone of some kind. Um, what that means is that we now have access, these devices, more computing power than the first spaceship to enter orbit, okay? By leaps and bounds. So we have a wealth of knowledge at our fingertips. Before we had to go to the library, some of you might be too young for this. We had to go to the library. We wanted to know something about a topic and search for a book. We had to get online, you know, find a good internet connection, go to Google, go to Yahoo and look for these things and do a lot of searching. Now, we have access to it at the tip of our fingers. We can find out any bit of information that we need right here. You can find answers to tests if you use certain websites. So this is why I'm an advocate of no, no uh, online testing, because uh, it's too easy. Um, we connect with everybody. We connect with our family. We stay in touch. Our cell phones have become an integral part of our lives. 
that's all, it's really good, but it also does have some downsides. So like most things, you do it enough, or you do it too much, it is technically considered an addiction. If it has some part of negative effect in your life, negative effect in your life, then it is considered an addiction. Now think about how much you use your phone. It's probably a lot, right? For the people that you know have iPhones and Androids, there's a little feature uh, where you can see your usage. Um, some people don't pay attention to that. I implore you over the next week or so, take a look at it. Take a look at your usage. It's going to be a lot. You all are college students. Some of you are non-traditional college students, but we use our phones a lot. Social media, looking at Pinterest. Um, you have a phone call. Um, so uh, social media, we have that. We have education. A lot of, especially with COVID going on, a lot of your education is done through what's the service you all use? Campus. Can yeah, the campus. So you're going to be looking at that. How much time do you think you spend looking at your phone? Anyone, anybody want to like give me a rough estimate? Eighty-six hours. Eight, eight, eight to six a day. It's impressive. Um, I feel like I was the same way. I love technology, which is one of the reasons why I chose this as a dissertation. I wanted to be able to mix my geekery, my love of technology with my love of psychology. Um, unlike most research where you have the physical sciences, you have A can lead to B or is it because of C. Psychology is a little different. We have to look at constructs. What the construct is, is it means we have to define an unmeasurable measure using words. So I can give an example of that, which we learn in psychology is how do you measure love? There's no test to the measure of love. So us as psychologists have to come up with ideas on how to measure love. One way that I, I when I taught college, and this is one of the lectures I gave, is we measure love, we could do it by a couple different ways. We want to do a phys physical touch. How many times do you touch your partner, significant other a day? How many times do you kiss? How many times do you talk? You take that information, we're taking a construct and putting it to a actual quantifiable number. Now this doesn't work for everything. Um, it kind of worked for part of my dissertation, but I like to prescribe to both the psychosocial model and the science model. I also like to blend like with technology and psychology, science and the research behind science and the constructs. So here's what we're gonna do first. I'm gonna ask you some questions and I want you, this is gonna, this is part of my dissertation. This is a survey I sent out to 200 people, okay? Across the US, different age ranges, different nationalities, different sexual orientations. So the whole gambit, because when you're doing research, you want as broad of a spectrum of participants as you can get, because then it translates better to the national population. So. You're going to keep, after I ask these questions, you're going to kind of keep a mental tally of how many you have. You have to hold up one, two, three. So what I did was I looked at the, the actual criteria for the DSM, which is what a psychologist use for diagnosis. Um, it's also what psychiatrists use for diagnosis, a set of criteria. So I came up with part of my um, dissertation, just changing one word, okay? Instead of a, like substance alcohol, or stimulants, I just changed the word to smartphone with a couple little like, adjectives to make it fit. So please, on your fingers, you're gonna indicate if this has been true over the past 12 month period, okay? So your smartphone use is often used for larger amounts and over a longer period of time than you intended to. Have you used your phone more and more throughout the day? Kind of dependent on it. So if that's the case, you got one. There is a present desire to cut down or control the amount of time I spend on my smartphone or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control my smartphone use. Okay, you ever wished, I gotta spend some time with people. 
Like, yes, digital is great. I get connected with people, but I probably need to connect with others physically. I probably use my phone too much. If that's the case, that's another one. A great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to use my smartphone. This is including making sure that you have access to a charger at most times. So I guarantee most of you that carry backpacks have a charger in your backpack for those cases, or you've got one pretty close. Another thing is you probably made sure every night before you go to bed to plug your device in. Okay, that's another one. A craving or a strong desire or urge to use your smartphone. You ever just be sitting in class or with your family and going, okay, but you can't really stop yourself. That's the problem, but you can't stop yourself. Recurrent smartphone use resulting in a failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, or home. If a teacher has told you, please put your phone away. If your parents have said, you're on your phone too much. If your friends or at work have said, you need to make sure you're not on your phone or gotten in trouble at school, work, or home. That's another one. Continued smartphone use, despite having persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused or exacerbated by smartphone use. Okay. Let's think about that one. That one's a little bit worded. Um, interpersonal problems is problems with your friends, problems with your family. Have you ever been in a relationship where you suspected your partner of cheating or been wary of someone on their phone? Or maybe you have too. Your a smartphone has caused, specifically, if this is if you are answering this question, is that you have felt a little shady on your phone. <laughs> and it's caused some problems in your relationships. Important social, occupational, or rec recreational activities are given up or reduced because of my smartphone. I really don't want to go out. I'm bored. I'll just sit here and play on my phone. I'm not going to go to class. I'm tired. Or, you know, you just don't want to go hang out with your friends. Well, your smartphone is, gives you access to a lot of that information that your friends are going to do. Um, smartphone use, uh, recurrent smartphone use in situations in which it is physically hazardous, illegal, dangerous to do so, such as driving or walking while texting. Now, I did a little bit of observational research when I was walking over here, and I saw a lot of people walking and doing this. Sure, I'm sure most of us have done that, or texted while driving. Looking at your phone, being distracted while you're driving. We're going to go into that one here in a little bit. Smartphone use is continued despite knowledge of having a persistent or a recurrent physiological or psychological problem that is likely to have been caused or exacerbated by smartphone use. That's probably the most difficult wording, but I had to stay faithful to the DSM for this to be a valid measure. Um, what that means is, have you ever thought that you've heard your phone ring? Have you ever thought you felt it vibrate in your pocket? Okay, this, this is the physiological withdrawal of our smartphone use. We constantly feel like someone's trying to get a hold of us. We constantly are looking for it. Oh, who's this text from? And you look at your phone and there's no text. There's gotta be a reason for that. I came up with a term and then found out about a month after I came up with the term, that another uh, researcher came up with the exact same term as I did. It's called phantom vibrate syndrome. I was quite upset thinking that I had this like new, new term to give out to the community and I could be attached to that, but no, someone beat me to it. Um, not so fun. Um, there's a desire to use my smartphone more and more. Okay, that was pretty self-explanatory. Uh, express serious discomfort or distress when I cannot use or access my smartphone. Well, who here has left their phone at the house or in your dorm? We panic. We will be late for class to go get our smartphones. Don't necessarily need them, but we have. We will, when we don't have our phones, 
Do you remember not having, everyone in here remembers not having their phone or leaving it behind, right? Okay. How did you feel inside? Did you get that kind of like butterfly in your stomach? Scared. Scared. You're like, oh God. And there's could be a multitude of reasons for that in case, like I said, you're doing something shady. Um, but we do feel this discomfort. We have what's called the fear of missing out. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go over that in just a minute as well. So, there were 11 questions. I'm not going to ask you to tell me how many you have, unless you're willing to. Um, seven, right? Oh, how many? Nine? Just say it. Four, okay. Anybody else? Ten. Okay. Would you care if I ask you? Five. Okay. So, what about you? Do you remember about six? Six. <laughs> All right. He's, uh, he's on it. Um, so what I did was I came up with a hypothesis. Whenever you're doing research, you have a hypothesis. I have three. Two of them are pretty relevant. One of them's not so much. Um, is that, actually, let me go into something else first. So depending on how many you have, if this was alcohol or any other substance, two more than two, between two and four, yeah, two and four, is a mild addiction to something. Four to seven is a moderate addiction. Mild is, if this was alcohol, your friends come to you going, I think you drink a little too much. Maybe you're partying just a little too much. Moderate is, you may want to talk to somebody. You may want to get some help. Anything above seven is a severe addiction. If this was alcohol or any other substance abuse, I would say you need to be in rehab, okay? So it doesn't take much to, for it to be mild. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Some things are just these addictions of our phone have become social norms. It's kind of like caffeine. If you drink coffee or pop or energy drinks, it's a socially acceptable form of addiction, although the addiction is in the DSM. You drink too much caffeine and you need it to function. It's technically an addiction. It causes an increase in the pleasure area of the brain. That is how addiction works. It's actually a physical thing. It's a physical reaction to an emotional response. So there's a lot, right? We got four, we got six, we got 11 uh, or 10. All right, so we have kind of the gambit here. Anybody get lower than three? Okay, no. Which is very congruent with the information I got on my dissertation. So I looked at, my hypothesis was, I presume that 60% of these 200 people will fit in the moderate or severe category. Okay? My research found that I was off by 1%. I was 50, it was 59% of individuals fell in to the moderate or severe categories of addiction. Now, technically my hypothesis was wrong, but eh, I'm gonna give myself the credit here. I was close enough. But in research, don't say that. It's never close enough. Um, personally, I felt it that way. The interesting thing that I found out is that 88% of the people that took my survey fell in some mild, moderate, or severe. That is a lot of people. That is a whole lot of people. So 10%, that's 20 people out of 200 didn't meet any criteria. Does anybody want to guess why that was? So why didn't meet? Yeah, why, why 20 people out of 200 didn't meet the criteria for any of the addiction? It could be. You're right. One of the other things I found, though, was that the older the population, the less that they rely on their technology. So... Because we, we live in a world, I'm, I'm 40. I kind of lived through the generation of not having like constant internet connection. I've seen the development of technology. 
and it growing to the to where it is right now. I've even worked for both Apple and Microsoft during my undergrad. I was an Apple genius, which is the most egotistical title you could give any individual <laughs> for a hourly job. Um, so I've watched this. I'm adamant about, I'm a big iPhone user. Um, I'm adamant about watching every like keynote that they give. I love technology. Um, I love what it does for us. I also despise what it does to us at times. But what I did find out is that the individuals who had most of their life without the smartphone didn't rely on them as much. But you younger generation, do you remember much of your life or most of your life without some type of smart device? Yeah. How many, so the smartphones have been around for about 10 years. Do you care about 19. 19. Okay. So you've had it for what, six, seven years? Okay. You also were one of the people that had a lower amount. So the more we use something, the more it becomes accessible to us, the more that we have it in our hands, the higher likely, based on research, we are to becoming addicted to it. It's an interesting thing that a device we can be addicted to. It's a hard concept to understand. Somewhat, right? So one of the other things I looked at was, which it's called the SPAI, which is the Smartphone Addiction Inventory. It's a more colloquial um, version of what I did. It was in China. It's actually not even normed for American audiences because China has more smartphone users than pretty much every country on the planet combined. Has a lot to do with how much their population in a small area. So when I went about going and thinking about this, I also wanted to think about the negative aspects of, of our smartphone use. Like I said earlier, most of us, if not all of us, have either texted while we're driving, even if it's a small text, or we've been walking and texting at the same time and not really watching what we're doing. Smartphone use and distracted driving is the number one cause of automobile accidents. This is why at and Verizon have all put out campaigns to not text and drive. Apple, Android have set up sections of your phone to where you're not disturbed while you're driving. We've probably all seen those features in our car. It's, it's, a, it's an integral part of the Apple CarPlay or the Android, whatever that one is. But that, that's not it. That's not all of it. People have passed away by falling off cliffs, trying to get the perfect selfie. Most of us have tried to take a good selfie, right? <laughs> Tinder, Facebook, whatever. But they're trying to get this, this perfect photo to present to the world that they did something awesome. So they'll sit there and they'll take the photo not knowing how close they are to falling off, and they've fallen off. People go to extreme measures to get, like this is an extreme, um, people have climbed the top of buildings just to get a picture, just to show off, fall off and die. Smartphone use can be very dangerous. Very dangerous. So one of the other things that I looked at was, like I said before, the phantom vibrate syndrome. We have these phones in our pockets, right? In our backpacks. We try to keep them as close to us as we can. But there's always this fear of missing out. Everyone's heard that term before, right? FOMO. Oh, I wonder what my friends are doing. I hope a friend doesn't like, I hope I don't miss anything if they're going to go do something or anything like that. It's just this fear that we have that we are going to miss out on something. I love it and I hate it. I like that I can have access to what my friends are doing. And if they want to send me a message and say, hey, you want to come on over? I'm like, yeah, let's do that. Or let's get on a game. It's quick. It's easy. We are more connected now than we have ever been in our entire lives. We're more connected now, not just us, than society has been in its entire existence. That seems overwhelming if you think about it like that. What do we miss out on? 
Do we miss out on the human connection of actually sitting down and talking to someone? Do we miss out on events with family, friends, because we're too busy on our computer? We have. Um, let me pull this up high. Let me want to pull this one thing out of my distraction real fast. I'm sorry, I can't on here. Okay. I'm sorry, it was only 16% of individuals did not um, meet the criteria for some smart smartphone addiction. Now, where do we go from this? Where does my research go from this? What about social media? I would say that is probably the number one app that most of us use. More than talking on the phone, more than listening to music. We want to connect. This inherent human nature of connection. That is what makes us who we are. Human beings are not solitary individuals. We are technically pack animals. We love being around other people. It's what gives us energy. Now, unless you're an introvert, then that's a little different. Um, but this is why during COVID, what have we missed out on? Right? Think about it. Did you miss your family? Did you miss your friends? We were forced to be a part. Now we used our phones. Like I said, there are some really good aspects of having our phones. We could connect to our friends. We could talk to them. We could FaceTime. We could see them. We could play games with them. We could watch a movie with them. But what we found out during COVID is that there was an increase. Sorry. Please try again. Oh, there you see it. Got my um, we found that depression increased during COVID. We found anxiety increased during COVID. Domestic abuse increased during COVID. Mania and bipolar disorder and depression, all of these together have increased. Drug use, overdoses have increased. It's a lot. This isolation that we had because we were forced to is very parallel to the isolation we have when we're on our phones when it's forced upon us, when we don't have the option to meet people in real life and just solely have to do this, we kind of take for granted meeting people, sharing a meal with somebody. Right? And I wanted to relate that to this because it's important to understand that all addiction. is not really addiction if you use it in moderation. Learning how, it's called responsible cell phone use. Understanding that I don't need to be on this all the time. I want to go out and see people. I can live without this. And this is a challenge that I put to you at home or you in here. Leave your cell phone at the house, turned off for one day. That's it. It's all act one day. This is what I wanted to do in my dissertation, but like holding on to people's phones, you, there's a lot of liability with that. But I want you to do that. I want you to put your phones up for one day. It's my challenge to you. Now, you don't have to do it. It's what I want, what I suggest. And then see how you feel at the end of the day. Write down some of, some of your emotions, some of like the events that happened that you didn't have your cell phone. If you want to be a little bit more drastic, go two days. There are these things like smartphone cleanses, right? Social media cleanses where people are just, I'm not going to touch it. What we found out, other researchers, other researchers have found that the less that we use this, the more that we put it down, the more apt we are to not use it, the less desire we have. That is straight up how they treat addiction. You do a detox. You put it up, you spend 27 days in detox, not drinking, going to therapy, talking with groups about other people that don't have their addiction. After 28 days of not using something, it doesn't have the same effect. Now, we relapse, people relapse all the time, but it negates some of that need that we have. It's all about wants and needs. When we use an addiction, we use a substance, we use a smartphone, it becomes a biological need. 
in the, I'm not going to go into the, like neurobiology because that's not my area of expertise, but I know it based enough to uh, describe that. It becomes a biological desire. Think of it like a thermometer. When you use something, something like phones, you get a little bit of little, little bump in it. Think about winning a game a little bit more. Thinking about drinking. There is some pleasure in drinking. That's the whole point of the, the substance, or you drink it. Yeah. But it produces this number. The longer that it gets in this thermometer, I think it's 20, 30, 40, and you're constantly drinking all the time, 50, 50, 50. 50 doesn't feel like 50. 50 feels like about 20. We've become desensitized to it. We've become tolerant to it. It's like any other medication. If you take medication for too long, your body becomes tolerant and you need a higher dose. Same with smartphones. So I want to look at, I wanted to look at how this, I actually wanted to write a book about this. Now, life got my way. I have two children and a wife. And I'm still in school for like the 29th year. So time is not on my side. I also work like three jobs. So I can't do that anymore. That doesn't mean someone in here that wants to go into psychology or someone at home can't. All research is is finding something you enjoy or finding something that you want to know more information about. And you take it and run. You decide. How can you give back? This was my way of giving back. It was a way that I could talk to my kids. I could talk to my wife. Now, my kids and my wife, my wife should have been my case study. She is always on her phone. Like, always. My kids are, too. But the younger the audience, the more they tend to, like I said, put it, tend to be on it. So I was a server. Well, I'll give you the, the original story of why this. I was a server at Bonefish. I was actually a manager at that time. Bonefish Grill is a really kind of like a three and a half, four star restaurant in Lexington. You would end up paying two people could not get out of there without paying minimum fifty to seventy dollars. Two people. So when I was walking around talking to all these people and making sure their food was good, I noticed something. I noticed that people were paying fifty to seventy dollars with their significant other or more people, and I saw this. Two people sitting in front of one another were not having a conversation. They came to a nice restaurant to talk on their phones and ignore the other person. So I looked around, kept walking around, and more than 60% of the tables, someone had their phone out. It was astonishing to me. When I go eat somewhere that's fancy, I want to enjoy it. I want to enjoy my company. I want to enjoy the food. But I, people are distracted. I'm guilty of it too. Don't let this lecture be, oh, uh, it is a, you know, a sermon on why you shouldn't use your phones. I'm, I'm really bad for it. There are certain times that I use this for work and I know I'm on it too much. I use it for personal. I also realize I'm on it too much. But what I did notice after I did my dissertation, my use went down. I was like you, six, seven, eight hours a day. Now I'm down to about three. I feel like I'm interacting more with my family, my friends. I'm making a, a conscious effort to not use it as much. But we need them. We need them for work. We need them for school. It's learning about how to use them responsibly. Okay. Now we'll leave it up to questions if anybody has any. That's, that was about it. Uh -huh. yeah, I have a question. Yeah. I know that some ethicists, and we had a kind of futurist here, and she was talking about how humans are evolving, and she referred to them as techno sapiens. Yes. And how the cell phone really is like an arm or a mm -hmm. leg or an appendage. So if you have a population of 88% of people who are using this at a level that's you know, pretty high, when does it move from an addiction to just like a normal part of life? I really think that it has already became a normal part of life. It is an integral part of our lives. Um, now, the geek in me worries about the inevitable takeover of technology like a Terminator. And I just, I just showed my age there. Um, but think about it. We have grown, like you said, we've evolved into being more technologically advanced. 
That's the purpose. We got to get smarter. Evolution is all about becoming better. Better in general doesn't always mean better individually, right? It's all about responsibility. Like I said, we rely on our phones. There will be a society. So let me explain something real fast before I answer that question. I could not test, I could not send out my survey to anyone under 21 years old. There's a lot of regulations you have to follow when you're doing research. And that is technically what's called a vulnerable population. So unless you have parents' consent, right? It's called an IRB, Internal Review Board, and they have to make sure you're doing it up to standards. So that was one of my concerns that I wrote as part of my results, and thank you for asking that, is that we don't know the people under 18, which was three years ago, what that's going to be like for them. What about the kids that you see now that are two and three, and they have iPhones in front of them? They're not going to know a world without an iPhone or some kind of smartphone. They're not going to know a world without social media. Now, I like to think of the Wally movie. Has anybody ever once seen Disney's is it Pixar or Disney Wally? What was that? Yeah. So part of it was that technologically advanced society where it was the individuals who were largely overweight, needing you know these hover wheelchairs to go around because they've become too reliant on it. There's a lot of movies that are like that. So I fear the day and slightly enjoy the thought of it because as the geek I am, uh, that kind of just seems interesting and fun. Who doesn't, who doesn't want a cybernetic arm? Um, we get smarter. As every year, our IQ gets smarter and smarter to the point that we, every about 10 years, we have to change the norms when we do an IQ test to account for the information that we have gained, that society has gained, that human evolution has gained. Anybody else? Uh, what was, like, just a couple of small things to do, like, like other activities, so you can be more, like, wanting to use your phone, like, just, like, need to do, like, what is other things, like, okay. So he asked, and I, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. Um, he asked, what are some of the ways that we can um, not use as much or decline that need? Is that correct? Okay, good. So there's a lot of ways. Part of it is it's all about self-control. First thing is leave your phone in your house for a couple of like, Don't start off like, don't, don't go cold turkey on me, okay? That does not work for most addiction going cold turkey like for alcohol. If someone's drinking way too much, like to the point of severe, I've had to tell people in the ER when I was doing that kind of work, don't go home, but don't stop drinking. It will kill you. People will have seizures if they stop drinking cold water, especially if they're using it like to the point of you really, really need help. Called delirium tremens is the name for it. So don't go cold turkey, leave it for an hour. Go have lunch, go have dinner with your friends. I, this is one, one of the things I used to do with my family because my kids had smartphones too, is we have a game. You can do this with your friends too. Everyone puts their cell phones in the middle on a stack. Whoever reaches and gets their phone first pays for dinner. <laughs> or they have to do chores or if it's kids, do chores around the house. It's a fun game you can do with your friends. Someone is bound to want to touch it. Okay. Yeah. So if you can hold out, you get free dinner. All right. And that's a fun way of doing it. It's you don't want to do it in a way that you feel major discomfort. You want to do it in like a positive way. And I find joking because, well, that's just my personality. Joking in little games, a good way of doing it. Instead of like just sitting there in your dorm or in your apartment and texting somebody, say, hey, you want to go to the park? You want to go play some basketball? You want to go play video game? Um, but something connected, something where you are with another individual. There are a lot of ways, and it's all personally up to you on how you can 
avoid that need. And everyone's different. What may work for you may not work for her. What may work for the people at home may not work for you. It's just taking the effort and being mindful. Mindful is a term we use in psychology a lot and in religion. Um, came from Buddhism, I believe. Um, but we use that. It's actually one of the common core elements of the most um, effective therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. Which is a good segue into why what you said was good. Cognitive behavioral therapy states that if I can change my thoughts cognitively, I can change my behaviors or vice versa. I can change my behaviors and change my thoughts on it, which in turn changes my emotions on it. That is the most effective form of therapy for nearly all mental health diagnoses. It's been more effective than in treatment of depression and anxiety than any medication has ever been. So next question. I think the cell phone has, has changed society as much as the automobile or as electricity. I absolutely agree with that. And going back to what, what uh, he was saying, we do evolve. We were before on horses, walking. Then the engine was developed. Then cars were developed. Then electric cars were developed. What's going to happen next? Oh, I'm really hoping for a flying car. All right. Super dangerous. I hope it flies itself. Tesla will obviously make it first. Um, but yeah, we, we do that. It's electricity. We were used to fight a lot of the fire with the sun. We needed it inside. Or running water. We have always, there is this pattern of human nature where we get smarter, we develop new things to make life easier. This is the first one of those things that's had a really negative effect on some people. In the DSM, there is gambling addiction. There is a section on new and upcoming ones, gaming addiction. Think about all those like apps you use on your phone. Like, Spend three dollars, get ten coins to where you can play longer. Huh. But you can't stop, right? You're like, oh, I need to go to the next level. I don't want to wait an hour to play again. So we'll spend the money recklessly. Kids do this all the time. They have to put, they, before they put parental controls on kids buying thousands of dollars on different apps. Roblox was a big one. My kids play that game and I despise it to its core. It's like, buy me this, buy me this, buy me this. No. That is real world money for digital goods. I can't get behind that. So any other question? Or did I answer that fully? Or did I answer that fully? Any other question? Oh, no, it's absolutely my pleasure. I'm glad to give back to the, the university that I came from. So if you ever want to be like me and become a psychologist, I'm more than happy to talk to you about that afterwards. Um, if you want to be like me and go to school for the majority of your life, then I'll tell you about that as well. Student loans are not fun. Um, I actually am, am my next degree that I want to get after this one is a, um, a doctorate in creative religion. So that's what I want next.